In 2023, Vatican official websites changed the word worship to venerate. But that's not even the case. They actually do worship Mary. A lot of Catholics don't even know that. You can yeah. call it venerate, you can call it adore, you can call it tomato if you want to. Yeah. What you're doing, you're worshiping the person. Yeah. We're not, we're not going here against the Roman Catholic people, not even against popes. Right. We're talking about systems and ideas. In fact, if you're not seeking truth, you probably shouldn't even watch this. But before we go into that, our names are Calvin and RJ, and on this channel, we make the Bible relevant and practical in your everyday life. If you're new here or not new here, please make sure to subscribe as we are approaching 10,000 subscribers, and a huge majority that tunes into this channel, unfortunately, are not subscribed. Now let's get back to the topic. So, a lot of you have been asking a bunch of questions about our video about three twisted teachings of the Catholic Church. Today we have a response for you. All of these comments right here are ones that we're going to address today. And so today, we also have a special guest on the podcast as well. We have our special guest, Deutschen Zividinovich, who is a professor at Weimar University and also a PhD in church history. Mm. Right? Anything else? That's it. Okay. And how are you? Welcome. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here and, and try to respond to some of these questions. Yeah. So let's go ahead and just dive straight into it. Sure. Uh, one of the comments right here, it says, you do not pray. You don't pray to Mary. You honor her and ask for intercession as you would ask a friend or family to mm. pray for you. Mm -hmm. You guys have a lot of twisted whatever. Mm hmm. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, first of all, I want to say that I come, my family comes from a Catholic background, so I understand Catholic culture uh, pretty well. I come from the most Catholic country in Europe, Croatia. Yeah. And so it's the the most attendance in Catholicism. And I have to Wait, say, that's I, the most ca most Catholic country in Europe? It, Croatia is the most Catholic country in Europe. Wow. Yeah, by attendance, the, the, the weekly attendance. Wow. And so my cousins have been baptized in the Catholic Church. Uh, my, um, they have been confirmed in the church, uh, and things like that. So I understand Catholic mentality and I understand how passionate and how offensive that may sound to them when you, you know, when you would say things like, oh, you know, you worship Mary and things like that. Um, but <laughs> in reality, Mary is a very large factor in the Catholic Church. Yeah. It kind of eclipses Jesus almost. They're going to be offended. I know you're going to be offended. No, it doesn't eclipse Jesus, but I, I know all of my Catholic uh, relatives. They spend more time talking to Mary and speaking mm. with Mary mm. than they would speak to Jesus. In the classical Catholic theology, mm -hmm. you know, and again, there's a classical Catholic theology and then there's a Catholic understanding for lay people. There's kind of like a two different worlds in Catholicism a little bit. But in the official Catholic theology, Jesus has something called sacred heart. Like sacred heart of Jesus, which needs to be touched by Mary. Otherwise, you know, Mary is necessary to, you know, Jesus is not the super merciful God in the Roman Catholic theology. You know, he, you know, in a lot of the frescoes in the, in the ancient church, in the medieval church, you will see Jesus' very stern face. Like he's a very kind of angry God a little bit. Um, again, on the lay terms, people like, you know, people are going to say, no, Jesus is very merciful. But in the classical Catholic theology, Jesus needs to be touched by his mother. This, I'm, I'm, I'm going to quote, um, he will not refuse the breast that he suckled. Hmm. So, so you need Mary to touch his heart because Mary, Mary nursed him. He's not going to refuse Mary. Yeah, it's kind of like he's going to refuse you, but he's not going to refuse Mary. Yeah, yeah. So you got to go to the mother. I see. Touch his heart. It's almost like it, as if his heart is not tender. Mm. And that that is a, that is a problem. Um, is that a biblical concept? We don't have that in the Bible where you need to go through Mary to Jesus. It always talks about go straight. You know, there is one God, one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ the just. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Mm -hmm. One God, one mediator. You know, but in the Roman Catholic theology, Mary is all, often called co-mediator, mm. co-mediatrix. And that's something that came from the Catholic Church. Yeah, this is, uh, this is the official terminology used by the many Catholic sources. She's, she's co-mediatrix. Now they will say, we don't worship her. You know, we venerate her. Well, actually, the... the, the the technical phrase used for their relationship to Mary is 
is hyper venerate. They don't venerate her. They hyper venerate her. Now tell me, what's the difference between worship and veneration? Okay, so in in the Catholic defenders, they especially in the Protestant countries, they will try to make Mary, you know, not as offensive to Protestants, you know, so that they can get Protestants into the church. So they yeah. will try to lower Mary's status a little bit, uh, so it doesn't look so offensive. That's why that question. Can you read that question again? Yeah, that absolutely. question says. It's just, yeah, go ahead. It says, you don't pray to Mary, you honor her and ask for intercession as you would ask a friend or family to pray for No, you don't. You don't. Because okay. your friend and your family, you don't hyper-venerate them. Mm. Okay. So in, in Catholic theology, you have to hyper-venerate. It's called hyperdulia. Mm. Those are technical terms. Hyperdulia. Dulia means veneration. Yeah. Latria means worship. They say they, they try to make that distinction. They say we only we don't like idolatry, idol you know, idolatria. Yeah. That's idol worship. You yeah. Know? So latria or worship is only for God, they say. But dulia, which is like a respect, veneration, it's like adoration, veneration kind of thing. Mm. That you can do that to the saints. But Mary is more than dulia. She's hyperdulia. And that's terminology that they use. So that you have to you don't hyper venerate. You don't even venerate your cousins, your your friends who pray for you. Yeah. So so this yeah, can you read that again? Can you read the yeah, question again? Yeah. You don't pray to Mary, you honor her and ask for intercession as you would ask. I honor friend. my grandma. It's not the same. Yeah. They don't honor Mary just like I honor my my mom. Gotcha, gotcha. It's not the same. And then how what, can you keep reading? Yes. Um You honor her and then you honor and ask for intercession as you would ask a friend or family to pray for no, you. No, you don't ask in cat. No, that's dishonest. Yeah, and and because the, you don't ask Mary for intercession just like you would ask a friend to pray yeah, for yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. Friend does not have any merit and virtue mm. in his life. In ca in Catholic theology, Mary has so much salvific virtue and worth that she was so saint and so holy that her holiness not only saved herself. But also spill bubbling over. It spills over into the chest of merits that when you pray, some of the Mary's virtue is applied to you. Mm. And then also she's the only one who can touch the heart of Jesus, the sacred heart. And so your friends and cousins cannot do that. They yeah. don't touch the, their virtue is not the same. Their merit is not the same. They cannot pay for your sin. Mary can partially pay for your sin. Oh, uh, according to the Catholic according Church. According to the official, but there's no biblical see, evidence. A for lot that. of no, that's not in the Bible. A lot of Catholics don't even know that. You know, mm. I, I would say ninety percent of Catholics don't know that there's uh, in in official Catholic theology. I'm talking about official Catholic theology. That's why I'm telling you. There's official Catholicism. There's lay Catholicism. They they, they don't always interface. Line up, yeah. The official Catholic theology is that there is a chest in heaven called treasury of merits, hmm. and in that treasury. There is good deeds and virtues of Jesus, Mary, and the saints. Mm. So Jesus is not the only one. He, Jesus, it, like, I, they would say officially that most merit is comes from Jesus. Yeah, but Mary also added onto Jesus's work, and saints also add into the chest. So when you pray to God to forgive you for your sins, you need their merit to mm. cover your deficiency. And guess who has the key of that chest? Peter. Peter is given the keys, Matthew chapter 16. Yeah. And so Peter, or his representative of Peter, is the Pope. Yeah. And so then, then Pope delegates that to the archbishops, cardinals, archbishops, bishops, priests. You go to the priest in the Catholic Church. He opens the chest for you, and he gives from that chest... So Mary's virtues are in that chest. Not your cousin, your brother who's praying for you is not praying for you the same way Mary prays for you wow. in Catholicism. Let's move on to the next one. The yeah. next one says well, this. Well, let me, let me, there's more. There's more to that. <laughs> so even though Catholics don't say that they worship Mary, yeah, you know, they officially they say we hyper venerate Mary. Okay. But that's not even the case. They actually do worship Mary. Mm. In the official Catholic teaching, this is from, uh, this is a papal encyclica. So papal encyclica is a papal official document that is inspired, they believe. So papal encyclica is Pope speaking ex cathedra. Ex cathedra spoke, Pope speaks, it's from God. It's infallible. And so the 1953 papal encyclica 
uh, called uh, papal encyclica, which is called Fulgens Corona, in 1953. Let me let me read it from you. Can I read that for you? Please, please. Okay. So, this is an English translation, which they changed on the on the official Vatican website in 2023. But I'm going to show you Latin. Latin says worship Mary. And you speak Latin, right? Of course. Yeah. A church historian, you have to speak Latin. You have to understand Latin. <laughs> but you speak like six or seven languages, right? I, I try. I try. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Talk okay, to us. What so is it? Here is, here is from uh, Pius the Twelve, Pope Pius the Twelve. Mm-hmm. Uh, September 8, 1953, paragraphs 18, 33, and 34. You can check it for yourself. You can go Fulgens. Corona, of, of, uh, encyclica. It says, this is the English translation. It says, there is nothing more sweet, nothing dearer than to worship, venerate, invoke and praise with ardent affection the mother of God, conceived without stain of original sin. Hmm. So this is, this is paragraph 18. Now paragraph 33. But where, as is the case in almost all dioceses, there exists a church in which the Virgin Mother of God is worshipped with more intense devotion, thither on stated days, let pilgrims flock together in great numbers and publicly and in the open give glorious expression to their common faith and their common love towards the Virgin Most Holy. So worship twice. uh, uh, Paragraph 34. But let this holy city of Rome... Be the first to give the example, this city, which from the earliest Christian era worshipped the Heavenly Mother, its patroness, with a special devotion. Mm. Now, until 2023, this was the translation. In 2023, Vatican official websites changed the word worship to venerate, Mm. but they didn't change it in Latin. Oh, which is the official language of the Catholic Church still today. Uh. And that is the official encyclica. Encyclica is in Latin. That's the official word of God to them. It's infallible. The, it, translations can vary, especially for the Protestant countries. You write in English, make it a little sound, you know, that, not so offensive. Yeah. But in Latin, the the words are colere, colere, colere. Colere means to worship, and that same word colere is used in the second commandment, mm. where Moses says, "Thou shalt not." worship or bow down to any graven images or oh, statues wow. or idols it says colere it's non adorabis this is in latin i'm gonna i'm gonna speak latin now okay no, no, i'm not speaking in tongues here it says <laughs> it says exodus 20 verse 5 you can check in the vulgate bible this is the official catholic bible mm-hmm. the vulgate latin bible exodus chapter 20 verse 5 says non adorabis ea neque coles coles means don't worship Mm-hmm. Idols and, and, and images <clears throat> in Exodus. So basically, Second Commandment says, "Don't worship creature." Mm. Is Mary created? Yes, yes in absolutely. Catholic theology, Mary is still created. He, she's not God. <laughs> and and the Second Commandment says, "Do not worship creature." Yeah. And uses the same word "colere," which the Latin uh, um, the Latin encyclica Pope commands the Catholics to "colere" Mary. Mm. To worship Mary. Same word is used in Romans chapter 1 verse 25 where Apostle Paul says, Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped colerunt, colere, and served the creature rather than creator who is blessed forever. Mm. So Paul in Romans 1.25 says that people started worshipping creatures. And that he uses the term colere. Mm. So that's the official term, colere. And so Pius the twelfth. A Catholic, the Roman Catholic Pope, he says in his encyclical, which is the official Catholic teaching, yeah, he makes clear the Roman Catholics must offer to Mary colere, what Moses forbade in the Second Commandment and what Paul forbade to creatures in Romans one twenty five. Well, so it's very clear. It's very clear that they are worshiping Mary at a different caliber. It's a different caliber. Yeah. So it, and it's not the same as so, hey your cousin that prays for you. It's not the it's same. It's a different. It's not the same, but, field, but, yeah. but you're going to see that a lot. Mm-hmm. You're going to have a lot of Catholics will tell you, I'm offended. You're saying that we do this, we don't do that. And this is, they always say that because um, this is kind of one of the ways to apologize and defend their faith. It's kind of minimize Mary for you. Mm. But when you come to church, no, it's not. Yeah. You know, 
Uh, and so first of all, she's not just interceding. She's, she's not just like um, your grandma praying for you. Yeah. She has virtue that she has to apply. To, she can apply to you. She can, she only can touch the heart of Jesus in this, in a way that she can. And also, she is not just venerated. She's hyper venerated. Those are the terms of the Catholic Church. And not only hyper venerated, she's actually worshipped according to the official Catholic. Mm. And now let's put it in practice. When a Catholic comes, and when he's like, "Oh, I can't go straight to Jesus. Let me go to Mary," you know, because she, I have a better better shot of being saved, being forgiven. And then that's you really depend on her, you know. Uh, you so so you know. Uh, so when you bow down before someone, when you light a candle to him, and you depend on the virtue of that person, that's called worship. You can call it whatever you want. You can yeah. call it venerate. You can call it adore. You can but call it down you, aside. You truly can call is it, worship. You can call it tomato if you want to. Yeah. What you're doing, you're worshiping a person. Yeah, in, for sure. In, in practice, and also in official Catholic teaching. Wow. Let's move on to the next one. Next one says, "I think you should do some. I think you should do real research about what the Catholic Church really teaches. Your ignorance really shows. Seek truth; you will find truth in the Catholic Church. Truth is a person. Jesus. Jesus is waiting for you in His Church, the one Church He founded. Now, you kind of hinted at this a little bit, which is where they got this from. Um, and then here's the remaining of it is, mm -hmm. and by the way, if it wasn't for the Catholic Church, we wouldn't have a Bible. Mm. There is nothing in the Bible that will contradict the Catholic Church mm -hmm. because the Bible is a Catholic book. So why do you worship Mary then? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Nowhere in the Bible it says to worship Mary or yeah. to believe in purgatory. Yeah. Or to believe true. that you, the, 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 the works of the other saints can partially be applied to you, to your merit. Um there is a li there's many many teachings in the Catholic Church that um, that don't agree with the Bible. Now my Catholic friends will disagree. They will just say, "Hey, you have to persuade me." Mm -hmm. Maybe the purpose of this podcast is to go little by little. So if you're a Catholic watching this, don't just like react. You know, brother, um, I understand how you feel. I, you know, I have Catholic family, um, and it's it's sometimes when you believe something, it's offensive. Like, wait a second, you're talking, you don't. It, you're going against my church. We don't want to go against people. Yeah. We don't go against people. We don't go. Um, there's many, many, many millions of Catholics who are good people. 100%. 100%. They're better people than, than many people in my church sometimes. Yeah. They're doing so many good works and they're doing the best they know. With what they know. And they, I believe they'll go to heaven. The Bible says that it, when there is, there is, when there is ignorance... God, God winks. winks. Uh, yeah. Acts chapter 17, verse 30 it says, God winks in the time of ignorance. So the many Catholics will be in heaven, and we're not, we're not going here against the Roman Catholic people or, uh, or, or persons, not even against popes. Right. You know, uh, we're talking about systems and ideas that um, I believe, you know, biblical ideas are more correct, and they're, yeah. they're, they're the ones we have to follow biblical ideas. Absolutely. And in fact, the point is to seek truth. Amen. Amen. In fact, if you're not seeking truth, you probably shouldn't even watch this. Right. It would be a waste of your time. Yeah. It's because the whole point is, what is truth? It's dangerous. Yeah it's, yeah. it's not about being right. It's about seeking truth. Right. Right. And that's why we have this video right here that we're responding because the yeah. whole point is to seek truth. You see, this here is another problem with the Roman Catholics. They just, Sometimes they just cannot leave the Catholic Church because they they kind of say, hey, it's the old. It's the oldest church. We go all the way down to the apostles. You know, how can that be wrong? Yeah. You know, but just think about logically, first of all, how about Eastern Orthodox Church? Mm -hmm. Why are you not Eastern Orthodox? Which has been around longer. No, the same. Th well, you can claim they've been, they've been, they've been one church since the apostles and then they split mm. in 1054, which is Catholic Church, actually, this fellowship. They say, we don't want to agree with you anymore because there's so many differences. They they split in 1054, but they go all the way down. They they were one body. They were one administration kind of. Yeah. Since the let's say since the apostolic time. Mm -hmm. So if your argument is we've been here long, that must mean we are correct. Just because you've been long here or longer since the apostles, let's say, that that's that means that we we are the true. Then then you should also consider Eastern Orthodox Church. Yeah. To be by yeah. the way. By the way, in the... It, but so, so in my argument to yeah. that, if I was Catholic, yeah. I would say, hey, 
Yeah. Christ didn't start the Eastern Orthodox Church. Well, he didn't start the Roman He Catholic did. He church. started it with Peter. He started a church. Well, right? Okay. That's the argument that's used. Okay, okay. So what would you say to that? Okay, so, well, you know, Jesus said he started his church. Right. Okay, so um, the Bible says that he, the, the Bible says that Jesus put a foundation of his church, not just on Peter. Right. If you read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, it says that the church is founded on prophets and apostles. Mm -hmm. It's plural. So it's not just Peter. Yeah. Ephesians 2.20, check it out. It's not just Peter. Peter was the first one who was like, hey, you are the Messiah, son of the living God. And she was like, praise the Lord. The Spirit spoke that to you. You are the stone. And on this rock, what you just said, that I am the Christ, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. So the other part of his question was, uh, he was saying that, I don't know what Bible you're reading to base your false claims on Scripture. And by the way, if it wasn't for the Catholic Church, we wouldn't have a Bible. There's nothing in the Bible that will contradict the Catholic Church because the Bible is a Catholic book. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning, they said, you will find truth in the Catholic Church. Jesus is truth. Jesus is waiting for you in his church, the one church he founded. Mm -hmm. So they're saying that the one church that he founded is the Catholic Church. Well, you have to understand that there is a the Catholic Church is a development. Okay. You see, it's not the same church in the first century AD and then 10th century AD. Yes. It's not the same teachings. Okay. You know, the first century AD, the, the second century, you're, you're, you're having a, the church develops, the third century, and... It's, it's really in the 4th and 5th century that you start seeing the shapes mm -hmm. of the Catholic teachings. So I, I, I can maybe, you know, maybe, you know, it's so I can compare it maybe with a, like, a, like a ship, like a boat. A boat leaves from the destination. You say, hey, that's the boat that left from San Francisco. It goes to Tokyo. So the boat leaves from San Francisco and then in the, somewhere along the Pacific Ocean, the pirates hijack the boat. Mm -hmm. They have a completely different legal system now mm -hmm. on the boat. I like that. They made changes on the boat. That's a good A bunch analogy. of people left the boat with the, like, those small vessels that you have on the side of the boat. That they And so a bunch of people left the boat and survived. And maybe those are the original yeah. you know, people from, from the original boat. They made it to Tokyo eventually on the small boats. But the main boat continues, makes it to you know, some, somewhere all near to Tokyo. And then a coastal guard of Japan comes and says, hey, this is not a legitimate you know, envoy. This is not a legitimate ship. But we left from San Francisco. It's the same boat that left from San Francisco. Yes, but it was hijacked along the way. Yeah. So the... So the continuity, just because the structure and maybe the, the geographical location of where the church was, uh, you know, and even the geographical location, the church started in Jerusalem. Mm. It wasn't even, it didn't even start in Rome. Yeah. Peter was not a first bishop of Rome. Mm. Let that sink in. Peter just came and died in Rome. He, Peter ministered everywhere. Yeah. Peter was one of the 12 apostles. And not even was he a foundation. The Bible says that uh, there's only one foundation, 1 Corinthians 3.11, and that's Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now, Peter is building on Jesus. And then, and then Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, it says the church is founded on the foundation of prophets and apostles. Yeah. Because prophets and apostles, they spoke, they wrote the words of Jesus. Well, the, and so Jesus is the only foundation. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says that Jesus is the only foundation. The only foundation, it says... For no one can lay a foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.11. Let me just rephrase that. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. 1 mm. Corinthians 3.11. So the yeah. foundation is Jesus Christ, yeah. not Peter. Yeah. When he says, uh, the rock, you are the Petros, you are Peter. But on this rock, I'm going to build my church. He is just doing a play of words. Yeah. Because Peter was called, Simon, he was also called a stone. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so he's playing with the word stone. He says, yeah, you're called stone. Yeah, because his name means stone, right? His name means stone. Okay. He says, you're stone. Yeah. But on this rock, which you just said, I am the son of God. I'm the, I, I'm the, I am the Christ, son of the living God. And that's on that rock. And then he uses a different term called Petra. 
Yeah. On this rock, I'm going to build my church. So really understanding the original language gives you the context in which he's talking. Uh, well, yeah, kind of. But even in English, you can see you're the, you're the, you're the Peter stone. Mm -hmm. And on this rock is not the same word. Mm, okay. You see, Peter is a stone. But by the way, Peter himself, let's just ask Peter whether he believes he is the foundation of the church or not. Mm. Let's ask Peter. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. You know what he says? I'm just a stone. And you all, he says, you all are living stones. So he says all the other members of the church are stones. Mm. All called a Petros or Litos. It's the same word in, in Greek. Litos, Petros. It's a, it's a, uh, he says, he, he even calls Jesus super Litos, big stone. So he says in 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter says... Um, Jesus is the foundation stone, mm -hmm. but all of us, he says, all the church members yeah. are stones. Mm. They, you just build the church. All the church. Peter was just the first one to recognize the foundation. He's yeah. like, oh, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, you got it. So in other words, hey, look, the foundation is Jesus. Right. And you are a stone. I'm a stone. Everyone's a stone. Everyone's and stone. so what we're going to do is here. we're going to build on the foundation that's yeah. already here, but you are, which is Jesus. But you're a good stone only if you are on the foundation. Yes. Because foundation, it gives you the length and the width. Uh-huh. So let's say you go outside of foundation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you? You're just like a whatever, reject. You're not a stone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're a stone if you, you are being guided Mm -hmm. by the parameters if you're on the foundation on right. the foundation by the way jesus uses the word petra which is rock in matthew chapter 7 already so be look check this out before jesus speaks to peter saying on this rock i'm gonna build my church he already explained in the gospel of matthew what the rock is mm, mm, okay mm. he's already told a parable about the rock mm. in matthew chapter 7 verse 24 he says who shall whoever listens to the teachings of mine builds on the rock mm. if you don't build on the rock you build on the sand and then it gets washed away yeah. So he says, whoever, and let me just quote the, the words exactly so that, that I, don't, I don't misquote. He says in Matthew 6, he says in Matthew 7, 24, he says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the Petra, mm. on the rock. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I will like, so he already, he already uses that term. Mm. He says, my sayings, my teachings, and you do them, my commandments, and you do them. You are then building your house on the rock. rock. And what's the rock? Jesus. Jesus' sayings and his teachings. Mm. And that's the foundation. And that's why it says here in, 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 in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, a brother Catholic, please check this verse, Ephesians 2, 20. It says that, that the church is built on the foundation of apostles and Plural. prophets. Plural. Plural. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, how can we be apostles and prophets when we just heard in 1 Corinthians 3.11 that no one can lay a foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ? Why is it says in Ephesians 2.20 that you're built on the foundation of apostles and prophets? Because when apostles and prophets, they're inspired by who? God. By Jesus. By the Spirit of Christ, they write down, God, God protects the writings of the apostles and prophets. Who, who, who wrote the Old Testament? Was Moses a prophet? Yes. Was Elijah a prophet? Yes. How about the other prophets? Prophet, how, who wrote well, the, was Moses a prophet? Moses was a prophet, yeah. Who wrote, who wrote the New Testament? Apostles. Paul's apostles. apostles. Yeah. So what are we based on? The Bible. The Bible. Mm. The teaching, my saying. Whoever be based on my sayings... He based it on the rock. Yeah. So the sayings, the teachings, the doctrine of Jesus is in the oh, Old wow. Testament and the New Testament. Now, and so that's why it says in Ephesians 2.20 that the church is built on apostles and prophets. Church is not built on fallible men. Yeah, for sure. It church is not be. built on Jesus. Right. But when the apostles and prophets are in the vision, in prophecy, and they write down, guess what they're writing down? The words of Jesus. Yeah. So that is the foundation. Now, not a fallible Peter. Peter was just like... One second he was like really with God, and the next second was like Jesus. No, no, no! I don't want you to die. Don't die, Jesus. Don't yeah. die. And Jesus is like get away from me. What? Satan. Satan. Next one moment he's a rock, and then the other moment he's a Satan. How fallible is that church? 
Right. You don't follow a man. Yeah. You follow Jesus Christ. He's the only foundation. Now, this is very important. And the reason this is so important is because this is what the Catholic Church places their foundation yes, on, yes, yes. which is Peter, yeah, Peter being the first pope even mm-hmm. or being the church that Jesus built so on. So it's assumed by the Roman Catholic Church yeah. that Peter is the rock. Yeah. And, 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 but, and Where did they get that from? Well, from, from, the, from Matthew 16. Okay. Matthew 16 says, you're the stone, and on this rock, I'm going to build my church. So a mis- misinterpretation. Yeah. Now, that, that you misinterpretation... Have to, you have to... Uh, if you see something like, oh, he, this is the rock upon which I'm going to build my church, that's important. Then you kind of take that word rock and build my church foundation, and then you look at all the other passages in the New Testament to make a doctrine. You don't yeah. just take one verse out of context. Sure. Right. Now, that misinterpretation carried so long in the church. It wasn't actually until the 4th century. Oh. The, fa- the first one is Bishop uh, Damasus, 380, uh, 385 AD. He's the first one who looked at that verse and says, Hey, Peter, that's Peter. Peter is rock. And Peter Peter died in Rome. And therefore, therefore, all the bishops that come after Peter in Rome must have the same foundation like Peter. Ha <laughs> ha. It's a lot of assumption. Yeah. First assumption is that Peter is the rock. Second assumption is that Peter built a, a church in, in Rome, which he didn't. So even if, if Peter was the rock, which he isn't, yeah, that doesn't mean the Roman church is built on Peter. Mm. Because Peter built a bunch of churches. Mm-hmm. Peter be, built a church in Jerusalem. Peter built a church in Antioch. Well, actually, Paul. Peter went and visited all the other churches in Asia Minor, in Syria, and Palestine. Peter traveled everywhere, including Rome. Hmm. Peter happened to die in Rome. But Peter was not the first bishop of Rome. Yeah. We don't have that nowhere in the Bible or in history. Now, speaking of this, Rome had a church before, before Peter came. Yeah. Rome had a church before Paul came. Paul writes the, the, the epistles to Romans. So we know that Peter is not the rock. Mm-hmm. That's clear from the Bible. Mm-hmm. But then there's a verse in the Bible that says that Jesus gave him the keys. Peter, right? Yes, Peter the keys. What is that? Because that's what a lot of Catholic people say. Absolutely. Is that, hey, the keys were given to him. Absolutely. So what would you say to that? But the Bible doesn't say, I give you alone the keys. Mm. You see, you know, Roman Catholics are very quick to jump when 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 Luther says we're saved by faith, you know Ephesians chapter two verse says we're saved by faith through yeah. grace, and Luther says faith alone, and then the Catholics will say, hey, where's where's the word alone? You're adding the word alone. They're mm-hmm. really quick to jump onto that. That Peter is kind of like emphasizing faith, and he says alone, and so P- Luther is in- inserting the word alone. But right here, they're not quick to jump. Mm-hmm. It doesn't say you alone. Mm. I give the keys and you alone can bind and loose. Actually, Jesus says that to the whole church, mm. not just to Peter. But remember, Peter is one of the stones. He is the he's probably a big stone. He was the leader. He was the one of the first he was the first stone, but Peter told all of us in 1 Peter chapter 2 that we all we are all living stones built into this into this church together. We're all built on the foundation of Jesus. Now, if you go to Matthew chapter 16, it says, "I give you the keys" of kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That same sentence, Jesus repeats that sentence Mm. in Matthew chapter 18. In Matthew chapter 18, he talks to the whole church. Yeah. And then the whole church, he says, what does that mean to bind and to loose? Like, what does that mean? It means you bind or loosen. You loosen an animal or you bind to connect it. Here and so he says, um, if you have a brother in Matthew chapter eighteen verse sixteen, Jesus says, if you have a brother that offends you, go talk to him first. Don't go gossip. Go talk to him first. Okay, and then if he doesn't listen to you, bring two witnesses. If you think you're right and the witnesses agree with you, if he doesn't listen to the witnesses, bring the elders. Mm. He doesn't listen to the elders. Bring the whole church. Mm. And if you you bring him before the assembly, we 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 point to the the fact that you're doing something wrong in the church, 
and you still don't and you still don't repent and everybody agrees in the church then it says you shall disfellowship the person he shall be to you like a heathen he's not part of the church anymore mm. and then jesus says in verse 18 as surely i say to you and then he says to you all it's in second person plural i assuredly i say to you all whatever y'all bind on earth mm -hmm. will be bound in heaven and whatever you all loose on earth will be loosed in heaven mm. so is that peter alone no no So who is he talking to? He's talking to the, he says, verse 17, and if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Assuredly, I say to you all, whether you all buy, whatever you all bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you all loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Mm. So loosing and binding is not given uniquely to who? To Paul, Peter. Peter, yeah. It's not given alone to Peter. Yeah. It's given to the whole church. Peter was the first one, as the leader of the church. He says, okay, I'm giving you the power to recognize who is repentant in the church, who is not repentant in the church, but get, he's not alone. Yeah. The whole church needs to get together, and then together with the leaders, we looked at the case, and then we loose or bind. Mm. That's the context that Jesus is talking about. He's talking about church discipline. Ah, uh, okay. Church discipline, yeah. I see. Now, another person said this. They said... Sacraments were instituted by Christ to follow the Catholic Church is to follow Christ himself. Mm -hmm. Now, we kind of already addressed this, but I want to get at the beginning part, which is sacraments were instituted by Christ. Mm -hmm. And so what are sacraments? Well, the word sacrament is a Latin word. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily in the Bible. It, it, it can't, The first time the word is used, I think it's in the third century by Tertullian, one of the... Um, church theologians in the third century and he uses the word sacramentum uh, it's possibly used in the letters of Pliny in, in the second century by a Roman not a not a Christian a Roman pagan uh, sacramentum means oath mm. a vow uh, it's an oath it's a vow hmm. and so um, sacramentum in itself the word itself is not a bad word the the word sacramentum just means an oath because early christians see baptism and the holy communion was kind of like a vow mm -hmm. it was an oath mm -hmm. it was like i pledge you know people would get baptized in, by immersion by the way not by sprinkling sprinkling was added later in the middle ages actually the even the roman christians the latin christians early on were immersing people So immersion was the way of baptizing early on. <clears throat> so that's another thing the Catholic Church doesn't do today, which is, again, you, so this is kind of the point, like the Catholic Church today is not the same as, as, it, before. as it before. Yeah, and so that's it, what you were mentioning with the ship. That's the ship, you know? it's a development. Yeah. So early, and even, yeah, so early on, you, you baptizing was by immersion. The word baptizo means in, to immerse. And so people were immersed, and when people immersed in water, they're kind of saying something. They're, they're making an oath. They're saying, I'm going to be dying to myself and every to day. Christ, yeah. and, living, and I'm going to be living into a new life the rest of my life. My decision is to die to self. Because when you go baptized into water, mm -hmm. you kind of like can't breathe underwater. Mm. Right, so right, It's right. a symbol of death. It's a watery grave. It's also a symbol of cleansing. Yeah. And so God cleanses you. You're dead to your flesh. And you're rising in the newness of life. It's a vow. It's a, it's an oath that you make that that you're going to walk with Christ. Same with the communion. When you take communion, you're saying, "I am partaking." And Jesus says, "Do this in memory of me." Nowhere does Jesus say, "Do this to acquire salvation." Yeah, you know. So the Catholic Church has turned it into a means of salvation. So it's called sacramental understanding of of the of the symbols these symbols this oath this vow that christians would make or in early christianity it, later on it already started kind of in the second century with Ir Irenaeus, but not all christians agreed and then it kind of development again the ship development yeah. hijacked later on it became um not expression of salvation you see for early christians in the new testament um People were saved, it says, you're saved not by works, you're saved by faith in, in God's works. Mm -hmm. You're saved by grace, you're forgiven by grace. And, and, and then uh, to, 
to to express salvation you say okay lord to uh, baptism was a public confession of your experience yeah, outward expression of inward experience exactly so baptism is an expression of salvation yeah not means to, to salvation, salvation. Mm -hmm. see that's the that's that's the thing so salvation comes first your relationship with jesus you come to jesus and said lord please forgive me i confess my sins you're my advocate you're you're the one who paid my price on the cross yeah and i believe it by faith Mm -hmm. And I believe you can forgive me. And then Holy Spirit comes and you feel assurance of forgiveness. Yeah. And you're like, wow, I feel Holy Spirit changing me. I will testify about that. And, yeah. and then to become part of the body of Christ, you, you, you do like a wedding ceremony. And then you, you go publicly confess. It's like wedding. Let me, let, me, let me give this illustration. It's like a wedding. You don't get married to a person to love her. Yeah. You got married because... As a result of love. It's because you already love her. Yeah. You already love a person. You're in love with the person. You already have a relationship. And then you want to publicly attest... Yeah. To everybody around. To people, to angels, to demons, to everybody. To say, I'm dying to self and I'm getting married to Christ. That's baptism. So, baptism is a, is a symbol. It's an expression of your love, of your relationship. So in other words, a sacrament is, even though the word wasn't used in the Bible, Yeah, Christ, I think it's the word oh, sacrament is the word. The word sacrament is not used in the Bible. That's a, that's a later. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> now, another person said this. But, 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 uh, but there's something in theology called sacramental understanding mm -hmm. of the memorials that Jesus gave us. I see. So the sacramental understanding is that you need to perform these cer ceremonies, communion and baptism and, and penance and others, in, in, as a stepping stone to get saved. Right. That's not what Jesus said. But that's, that's not, you don't have that teaching in the Bible. The Bible right. is just giving, Jesus says, do this in memory of me. Yeah. You know, it's a memorial. I see. It's like an expression of your salvation. It's not a means to get saved. Right. So another person said, now, this. if you don't want to take baptism or communion and you can, you're kind of saying, I, 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 I have Jesus. This is why those are important. This is why people confuse them because they are important. Those, uh, those rituals are important. Jesus uh, appointed them. Yeah. And why are they important? Because you're publicly confessing Christ and even communion is your, your communion is every time you got together, we break bread we eat the bread and we eat the grape juice. We again reaffirm our initial decision yeah. of baptism, but it's a it's a public confession. It's like saying I want to love you, but I don't want to marry you. Mm. I mean, you can love a person, kind without of, marrying them, but yeah. without marrying, it's kind of saying, but you don't really trust us. Then you don't really trust our relationship. You don't right. want to show everybody. Yeah. So that's why Jesus says baptism and it, it's they're not means to salvation but yeah. they're just expressions natural expressions of when you love somebody uh, when you are in a relationship you're naturally going to go to dinner it, the, the communion is like a dinner right communion is like a dinner it's like if you love your wife you, of course you, you you don't like oh i need to go to the dinner with my wife in order to love her yeah. No, it's like you love her already. It's a natural thing that you're going to have the supper and dinner with your wife. So that's what communion is. Communion is, is re-emphasizing re your commitment to Jesus. Yeah. So another person said this, Who do you think you are to judge, prophet, angel, God? Both of you just the human who will die any moment. You can believe whatever you believe because you are Protestant. You can protest whatever you want. Praise but the Lord. Don't judge other people. Now, this one, I'll actually even address this myself yeah. because who do you think you are to judge prophet, angel, and God? Well, the Bible actually tells us that we will judge angels. Amen. Right? We are to judge, and a prophet is just a, a messenger of God, so we'll judge them too. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Mm -hmm. It says, you shall judge angels one day. Mm -hmm. And it says, don't you, don't you think you can judge the smallest matters in the church? So Paul tells us actually to judge. You can pull that up, that verse, yeah. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It says you, sh you should judge. Yeah. Right. And then it says... We're not judging people's motives. Exactly. We're not judging people. The whole point is the Bible actually does tell you to judge people. The right. point that's not to judge is about their salvation. 
Right. It's not a matter of not judging them That's on good right. fruit. Yeah. You don't go to the store and say, oh, yeah, let me get this fruit. Let me get this fruit. Let me get this. No, 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 no. What do you do? You inspect the fruit. Mm. You make sure that the fruit is actually good to eat before you just purchase it. That's right. And so that's what you're supposed to do is be a fruit inspector. Yeah, yeah. So is this fruit rotten? You're yeah. not going to get that fruit. So mm -hmm. that's all I'm doing is showing you which fruit is rotten. Right, and he is judging, on the he is judging you right now on that with that comment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and we're all judging, we're, but not judging in a way of like determining your salvation. Right, exactly. And this is different. There's executive judgment and there's investigative judgment. Mm -hmm. Executive judgment, only God can execute you or whatever. Yeah. But we're investigating. We're like, wait a second, is this biblical? Is this not biblical? I don't think this is right. We all need to evaluate and be able to address and judge. Exactly. What's right. But, the, but Jesus says, take the beam out of your own out eye. Of your, on, out your own eye, and then you will be able to see the draw, the speck yeah. in your brother's eye. Did Jesus tell you to, to check the speck in your brother's eye? Yeah. That's called judging. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. But first, you have to re-examine yourself. Right. That's why we're Before on this podcast. Judging, yeah. We need to pray every time that we don't offend people. Yeah. We need to pray. Say, Lord, Father, forgive me. If I have any sin on me, I confess and forsake, and and I believe in the blood of Jesus cleansing me. Amen. And then we can go and talk about different things. But That's if right. you're not, if you have sins in your life, and you're talking about other people's sins, now first clean up your your dorm. Yeah. And then you can go and tell other people. That's right. That's right. Okay. So another person says this. They said the Bible was never taken away, rather until the era of the printing press. It was cost prohibitive for individuals to own. So we had made a statement that said that the Catholic Church had stripped Bibles, chained them, and people couldn't own them. Mm -hmm. So this is his response. Oh, okay. So what did he respond? The, the Bible were never taken the away? The Bible was never taken away, rather until the era of the printing press. It was cost prohibitive for individuals to own. Well, that's not correct. Because there there was a series of church councils which made official Catholic proclamations that lay people should not own the Bible. Mm. I can read it to you one right please, here. Please, please. Here is um, Conventus Taraconensis in Mansi, who is Mansi is a compiler of Catholic books in, in sacred councils. And this is from the Council of Toulouse in France in 12, 12, 12, 29. Sorry, 1229. So he's, the, here's a, a translation in English. It says, we, the church, we prohibit that the laity should be permitted to have the books of the Old or New Testament. We most strictly forbid their having any translation of these books. Wow. So laity could not have, Very clear. even in Latin, or, and this is not just one, uh, you had not just to lose. You have the councils in Spain, you have councils in Germany, you have in different regions, different church councils, and they have repeatedly have been, uh, because people have been trying to read the Bible, like the Waldensians, and there were, there were true Christians who separated from the hijacked pirate ship. Mm. The Waldensians, the Celtic Christians, the Lollards in England, the Bohemians, the Hussites, uh, the Nestorians in, in the East. Uh, the Paulicians in, in, in Asia Minor, there were dozens of a, groups who were separated one from another because of persecution, mm. who, were, who were actually reading scripture in the original, in, in, in the languages that they had at, at, at the time. Yeah. And so they were really focused on the Bible. <clears throat> so you have a lot of tr uh, New Testament evangelical Christians in the Middle Ages that escaped and they were hidden and they were, they were kind of... Uh, separated from the main, the main traditional church, which became corrupt in the Middle Ages, and they were and they were reading the scriptures. The reason why they were reading the scriptures is because the Catholic Church was teaching certain things, and they were like, "Well, that's not in the Bible." Well, we know we have to then show people the Bible, mm. and that's why all these movements, Waldensians, Albigensians, all these movements. So here is the Council of Toulouse, a German Catholic theologian. Staphylus, very famous Catholic theologian from the 16th century, he expressed the general Catholic sentiment towards the Bible at the time. He was quoting Polish Cardinal Hosius. He writes, quote, To give the lay people the Bible is to cast pearls before swine. Wow. End quote. This is Frederick Staphylus, Prodromus in Defensionem Apologiae in Cologne, 1562. 
Wow. Um, even after the Reformation, for example, the Council of Trent, which was in 1546 to 1563, the Council of Trent has put Bible on the list of forbidden books. Wow. So yeah, council after council after it's council. It's even after the Reformation, before Reformation, after Reformation, the Catholic Church was so afraid of common people reading the Bible because they would just see that you know there's differences between mm. the Catholic teaching and the Bible teaching. Here's a papal encyclical mm -hmm. from 1713, Unigenitus. Okay, you can check this all for yourself, which prohibits laymen to read the Bible, calling such desire to read the Bible, quote, evil-sounding, scandalous, heresy, end quote. So, so desire to read the Bible is evil, evil-sounding, scandalous heresy, according to the official papal encyclica, Onigenitus. That's crazy. And I'm quoting not even the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. Mm. There's hundreds and hundreds of quotes from, from the official Catholic documents from all over Middle Ages, from the Catholic councils and mm. the papal encyclicas fighting that nobody should read the Bible, not just people outside of the Catholic Church, but people in the church that should not read the Bible. Yeah. Now, did did the Catholics smuggle the Dua Reims English translation into England? Yeah. For that, the purpose that was, of Catholics. That was in 1582. Yeah. 1582. So this is this this is what happened. Uh, the British, they started printing their Bibles in English. They wanted to read the Bible, not in Latin, because common people don't read Latin. They read English. So Tyndale was already first before Dwy Reims. Mm -hmm. So what is he saying? Okay. He says, before the KJV, Catholics smuggled the Dwy Reims English translation into England for recusant Catholics to read the Bible So he's trying to say that English. how Catholic Church is promoting the Bible with that comment? Well, no. Before Dwy Reims, you already had Tyndale Bible in 1525. Mm. Last time I checked, 1525 is way before 1582. So 1525, you had Tyndale Bible, which is actually 70% of King James is based on Tyndale Bible. Then you have Geneva Bible, which is also English Bible, which is used by Shakespeare. So this is all before Dwyer Rames Bible. And yes, Dwyer Rames was a Catholic translation. They said, okay, we don't want, we don't want Protestants to have a monopoly on the Bible. We're going to produce our own Bible. Mm. So they produced Dwyer Rames Bible, which was based... On the um, on the Vulgate Latin, and they and they were saying, "Hey, look, we also care about the Bible." Yeah. So they did smuggle English Bibles into England uh, to give to their Catholics because they were saying, because uh, the, the 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 argument of the Catholic Church after the Council of Trent was that uh, the whole Europe was in commotion. And everybody was saying, hey, these Protestants are great. They're giving us the Bible in our own local languages. Isn't that good? Isn't that what Jesus would want us to do, to read the scriptures? Didn't Jesus say, search the scriptures, and in them you shall find eternal life? Well, let us search scriptures. And the Catholic was like, oops, we have been forbidden scriptures for hundreds of years <laughs> by official councils. How do we rectify this? Mm. So they said, you know what? Let's give them the Bible, but let's say that why we didn't want to give pro why didn't we didn't want protestants to this di di uh, you know to disperse their bibles is because protestants don't have the entire bible okay now speaking of this speaking so, of this so they were saying yeah so they were saying we have the apocrypha yes so they <coughs> they included the apocrypha inside and they saying i see this is why we didn't want to give you the bible because you didn't have the entire thing which according to <coughs> all the church fathers the yeah. apocrypha is not even part of. Yeah, the apocryphal books of the New, of the Old Testament, Tobit, Judith, First Maccabee, Second Maccabee, Sirach, Ecclesiasticus. Those books have first of all, these books don't claim inspiration. Mm -hmm. They don't say this is the word of the Lord. They don't say this is the word of God coming to me. I'm a prophet. I'm writing things down. No, that's not like saying like Jeremiah, Zechariah, Isaiah. They all say the word of God came to me. I'm writing it down. So these apocryphal books are Jewish history books. Yeah, so it's history books right. mingled with fables, though. Correct? There are a lot of fables. There's yeah. a lot of non-biblical teachings in them. That's true. Uh, they, were not they, were not, uh, they were not considered uh, inspired by the Jews. Yeah. We don't have any evidence of Jews see them as inspired. They don't claim inspiration. Now, why, do, why does that matter, that the Jews <laughs> themselves see the it The Jews didn't see them. The Jews they believed that the canon was closed with Malachi. Baba Bachtra 4B. This is a cat. This is a, 
uh, the Jewish tradition, the, the Jewish uh, Targum. Uh, the Jewish Targum says that the spirit of prophecy was given until Malachi. And then, we, you know, during the time of Jesus, they were like, the last prophet was Malachi. They clearly said that. So mm. we don't have evidence from the, from the Jews saying that these deuterocanonical books, these books that came later during the Greek time, that they're part of the scriptures. Yeah. Uh, Josephus, he quotes the whole... Josephus is a Jewish historian Yeah. <coughs> from 90 AD. Who didn't even believe in Jesus, right? He didn't believe in Jesus. He was Jewish. He, he worked for the Romans, but he was Jewish. Uh, we don't have evidence that he was a believer of Jesus. He does mention Jesus in his writings. Right. Josephus, he writes a list. He, he just talks about Jewish lifestyle and Jewish... Uh, and then he mentions, hey, we have... This is our scripture. And then he gives a list of the scriptural books. Guess what? No, no apocryphal, apocryphal books. Yeah. Uh, you have four Ezra, which is like a... Like a like a book of the Jewish literature during the time of Jesus also mentions the canonical list, no apocrypha. Mm. You have Philo of Alexandria, which was uh, one of uh, the greatest philosopher of Jewish people in maybe 50 AD in Alexandria. He writes a list. We have his list, no apocrypha. Yeah. Uh, we have early Christians. We have Jerome. L let's just talk about Jerome. Jerome is the the Catholic, well, Catholic, he's the early Christian um, translator. He said, let me translate the Bible from Greek into Latin mm -hmm. so that people in the Western Roman Empire who speak Latin so they can read it. So Jerome translates into Latin and he adds those apocryphal books and then he says, these are not inspired. These are just historical so you can know the Jewish history a little bit. Mm. He says it. He puts it in the Latin Vulgate and he puts it at the end. Not in the middle, at the end. Mm. And then he says, these are not inspired. These are just for historical education. I see. And then later, 100 years after, people are reading Latin Vulgate. They say, oh, what are, what are these books? Oh, let's put the... And they, they start thinking they're inspired. Yeah. So that's the, during the Middle Ages. I see. The official proclamation was the Council of Trent. This is in 1563. Uh, that when Council of Trent ended, the, the official proclamation was like, these books are part of the Bible. Mm. But... Neither Jewish tradition, neither Christian tradition. You have neither uh, they claim they're inspired and they have a lot of mythological stuff. And when you say the official thing that passed, you're speaking of officially put in by the Catholic Church. Yeah, official Council of Trent. Not even the standard of Christianity. Right. The official okay. Council of Trent in 1563 declared um, or recognized these books as, yeah. as, as fully part of the scripture. But in the Middle Ages, people have been quoting them as scripture, but there was no official <coughs> claim. But you can see that in the early church, the early Christians were saying, no, these are not part of the inspiration. Okay. Yeah. Now, but speaking see, of... During the Reformation, the, the Reformers started spreading the, the Bible the, without the Apocrypha. Yeah. And then the Catholics were like, man, how do we get into this? How do we show that we are also care we care about the word of god because mm -hmm. the protestants are winning and they're taking over half of europe they're saying we need to start printing the bibles but we have the full bible so they kind of came with the dwight rames bible for that reason i see now speaking of that <coughs> they were saying hey the apocrypha wasn't in there so that's why this whole thing took place mm -hmm. and they didn't have that so that's why we didn't claim that now that's not the only thing that they added there were also some things that they took away, right. which was from the Ten Commandments. That's and I bring serious. this up because yeah. we had mentioned this in our previous episode, and one of the responses was this. Mm -hmm. We never changed the commandments. You probably don't even know there are two sets of the Ten Commandments, okay. and we go by the latest version in Deuteronomy. So let's go ahead and address that really quick. <laughs> yeah. Let's go ahead and address that really quick. Yeah. These different things. And, and another person also said that it was not Ten the the Ten Commandments were not numbered. Okay. So let's go ahead and address that really quick. What would you say in yeah, response? There to are this? two listings of the Ten Commandments in the Bible. And yes. One is in Exodus chapter twenty, and mm -hmm. the other one is in Deuteronomy chapter five. But they're all the same. Yeah. They're both the same. I mean, there's there's one small difference in the Fourth Commandment, but that doesn't change the meaning of the Fourth Commandment. Um, th so they're all the same. Uh, in, however, in the Catholic Catechism, okay, this is the official Catholic Catechism. Now, they, they, when they teach what the Ten Commandments are, um, here I'm going to pull out the Catholic Catechism. 
um, when they teach what the commandments are, they put numbers. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten. So I don't know what this guy's saying. They're not numbered, but Catholic catechism puts numbers on it. Yeah. So maybe you should <laughs> check with your Catholic catechism. Um, so the Catholic catechism just says first commandment, the same like in Exodus chapter 20, Deuteronomy chapter 5. I am the Lord your God uh, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of house of bondage. You shall have not no no are the gods before me. Mm -hmm. So this is the first statement. This is the first commandment of God. Now the second commandment in Exodus and in Deuteronomy, they're the same. Yeah. It says, you shall have no, you shall, you shall not make for yourself any graven image, no statues, or any likeness, or any likeness, no image, no just, no, not just statues, so graven image, or any likeness. Okay, now just really quick. Yeah, you're quoting from the Bible I'm or the Catholic Bible. Okay, I'm so we haven't Bible. addressed the Catholic. Okay, yeah. So this is straight from the Bible. So this is okay. From the Bible. You shall have. You shall not make for. This is Deuter This is Exodus chapter, chapter twenty, verse three. You shall not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above. So no Mary, no saints. Well, they're not in heaven, but it's okay. Or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You should not bow down to them or serve them, for I am the Lord your God. I'm a jealous God. And so on and so on. He says, I, I don't share my glory with statues and images. Yeah. Okay. And so this whole 50 words, this whole thing is completely missing from the Catholic Catechism. Mm. Completely missing here. Like there's, there's a hole. Would that also be the same as the Catholic Bible? No, the Catholic Bible, Dwight Rames, it's the Bible. The Bible still has the Ten Commandments okay. as, as they are. They're, they're not going to just take things out of the Bible. Yeah. Praise God. But they will mistranslate, like Vulgate mistranslates so many things. That's why Martin Luther came later and said, man, this is totally mistranslated. But we can talk, this is a completely different topic. It's going to lecture for a whole hour how the Vulgate is is a erroneous interpretation, translation. But again, and this is the problem with... with with a lot of Catholic, when you when you start talking about Catholic Church teachings and and biblical teachings, you mention one thing, it leads to another, and then you need a whole hour to prove this. Yeah. And so you're gonna probably gonna have a comment. Hey, he didn't prove this. What? what next presentations we'll talk about yeah. Latin Bible and, okay. and why is it missing. But here, for example, we're proving this. Uh, Catholic Catechism completely omits the second whole commandment. second commandment, mm -hmm. and so. Then you're going to have nine commandments. That's kind of odd because God says in the Bible, these are the ten words I am giving to you. Yeah. The, you know, these are the ten, ten, ten commandments that I'm giving to you. So the Bible, the God himself says in the Bible, here are ten, and now you're going to have nine? Mm. So what are the Catholics going to do? They're going to split the tenth commandment into two. Mm -hmm. See, the, ten, the, the tenth commandment says in the Bible, um, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not covet your, his manservant or his maidservant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. So the commandment is about what? Coveting. Coveting. Thou shalt not covet neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet neighbor's wife. Thou shalt not covet manservant, maidservant, ox, donkey, anything that's your neighbor. So it's about coveting everything. They split it into two. And they say, nine, you shall not covet neighbor's wife. And then 10, you should not covet your neighbor's goods. Mm. Even though the goods are mentioned before the wife. See, the, it says you should not covet your neighbor's house first. Then you should not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, mm -hmm. ox, donkey. So house is mentioned first, but they put wife first. Oh, <laughs> so I they see. split the Ten Commandments into two. And, they, and then they say, well, because we love women so much, we split them into two. So that the ninth one is about coveting neighbors. So you have two commandments about coveting. Yeah, but that doesn't give you permission to do that. Yeah, I mean, you can do that with the second commandment. I can split it into five commandments if you want to. Right. I can say, do not worship the image. That's the second commandment. Do not worship the, the likeness. That's the third commandment. Do not worship what's under the waters. That's the, third, that's the fifth commandment. I can, you know, do that as well. Yeah. Or the fourth commandment. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Uh, seven days, the Sabbath day, in it you shall do no any work. You, your servant, your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, your cattle. They should make a fourth commandment that the, 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 the servant should not work on the fourth commandment, and then the cattle should not work on the fifth commandment. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, you can do, you can do whatever why you want you once split, you start taking Why don't you split it like that? Why don't you start splitting the commandments like that? It's it's really because the second commandment talks about something that the Catholic Church does. I see. And that's making graven images mm. of things above, or things under the earth, or things yeah. on the earth. Wasn't there a period? Images and statues. Wasn't there a period of time where they didn't, where they, it came up about removing the images from inside of the church there was a period there was a, of there was a period of time around 700 a.d yeah which is called iconoclasm period where a lot of people within the church were saying hey what wait a second we're having all these statues and images being introduced yeah. into the church and does, doesn't the second commandment go against that so so for about 100 years there was a debate and fight and there's uh, some churches and some kings emperors in the byzantine uh, kingdom that they destroyed the statues and images, but then they brought them back 150, 60 yeah. years later and kind of got stuck with that. That's why the Orthodox Church, they kind of like, hey, they have a compromise. They, they have images, but not statues. Mm. <laughs> it's like we can have images of Mary but and saints. Statues. But this is the thing when you have Mary and saints and things like that, you're having middleman between you and God. Yeah. And you instead of developing relationship with God, where you're just saying, Jesus, Lord, Please come, forgive me my sins. I confess and forsake all my sins. I give send me your Holy Spirit. You communicate with directly with the Lord. You mm -hmm. know the Bible says in Hebrews chapter four verse sixteen it says, "Come ye boldly unto the what throne of grace." Mm -hmm. Throne. You come boldly to the throne of grace. You can communicate with Jesus directly with God, but if you start communicating with saints or Mary, and they become, you develop relationship with them. Mm -hmm. And 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 God says, I'm a God. I'm a jealous God. Yeah. I want to have relationship with you directly with you. I want my Holy Spirit to inhabit you. But if you're praying to someone else and you're asking them and you think that they will provide you something, and that that's idolatry. Yeah. That's so you you can call it veneration. You can call it tomato tomato, uh, yeah. but it's idolatry. Yeah. Right. Wow. This is a lot to chew on. <laughs> Very heavy That's topic. Right. So there's no difference between Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5. Yeah, it's there's the, the same thing. They all took, but the Catholic Catechism definitely has a huge chunk taken out. The second commandment is completely gone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's something for you to chew on. Think about this. The whole purpose in doing this is to inform and to bring out the truth yes. in the points that we brought out. And so thank you for tuning in. If you got this far, go ahead and click the previous video to see the context of this video. And there will be more to come. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button and share this with someone that needs to know the truth. Until next time, we'll see you. Peace. God bless you.